Well, guys, welcome to church. Welcome to our family, our church family. And uh, if you haven't been here with us, we've been going through the book of Judges. Okay. Uh, the book of Judges, the reason why uh, I think the book of Judges is so relevant to today is because in the book of Judges, like, like I said, the theme is everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It's the tragedy of the book of Judges. And I believe it's so poignant for today because that's exactly where we are in our culture today. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. The question that I want to ask today, though, is if everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes, will they really mind if you do what's right in the eyes of God? Let me say that again. If everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes, everybody's doing their own thing, will they really care if you do what's right in the eyes of God? After all, in our culture today, it's you do you, right? You do what makes you happy, I'll do what makes me happy, and we'll all be happy. That's kind of the idea behind it. But is it true? There's some of you in here who've just recently started living your life for Christ and all of a sudden people are angry with you for no reason. Why? If it's, if it's you do you, right? And so we're, we're actually going to jump straight into Scripture today. I, I, I'm very excited. Uh, I've, I've, the story of Gideon is, is absolutely wonderful. If, if you weren't with us last week, uh, we're going to be opening up to um, Judges chapter 6 again. We're going to be completing that chapter. Um, last week, just to kind of catch everybody up, uh, God calls Gideon to handle the, the Midianite and Amalekite threat, right? Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a hilarious situation because here's uh, Gideon. He's kind of a weakling and he's hiding from the bullies. And then all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord shows up and says, Hey, wow, mighty man of valor. Really nice to meet you, right? And, and, he's, and so he complains. He complains that Yahweh has left. And he, and he says, Hey, listen, if the Midianites are a problem, then you go and you fix it. I'll be with you, right? And so we go through this whole thing and he, he realizes how powerful God is. It's pretty amazing, all right? So now... Uh, we, we actually uh, left off with this last verse, verse 24. It says, Then Gideon built an altar there to Yahweh. Remember, whenever it says capital L-O-R-D in the Old Testament, that is the name of Yahweh. If you look it up in Hebrew, it's Yahweh. Then Gideon built an altar there to Yahweh and called it Yahweh is peace. To this day, it's, uh, it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abyssalites. So at the time that this was written, it, this altar that he made was still standing. But now Yahweh begins to speak to him on a regular basis. So that very night, verse uh, 25, Yahweh said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. There's a lot in that scripture, right? So uh, we learn from that scripture that Gideon's dad was a Baal worshiper. And not only did he own it, but this, this was a, uh, an, uh, an altar that a lot of different people would worship Baal. So, so Gideon's own father was leading people to worship Baal and Asherah. Now, uh, I know that most people don't have a whole lot of experience with ancient Near East gods. Okay, So uh, let me explain to you who Baal and who Asherah are. Okay, um, if you're familiar with uh, Greek mythology, you remember Zeus, right? And he's he's the god of the lightning bolt, and he's kind of the he's he's kind of the daddy the daddy one, right? Like he's kind of more powerful than than most of the other ones. Well, that that's Baal. Baal was the god in the ancient Near East of the lightning storms, of the thunderstorms. Okay, and he was the one who brought rain, and he was thought to be one of the most powerful gods. Asherah was actually a female god, but she wasn't a warrior. She wasn't like Athena, who was like the, the warrior goddess. No, she was like an influential goddess. She had the ear of a lot of the different gods. In fact, not only did she have the ear of a lot of different gods, she was also said to be the mother of 70 gods. Okay? And uh, I don't think they were all the same father, so... I think there was a little bit of, you know, th this whole idea of, uh, you know, fertility. And so to worship her, you would do things that Yahweh would not approve of, right? 
But the idea of, of, uh, of worshiping Asherah is she has influence over all the other gods. And so if, if she's on my side, then I'm better off. You get it? So there was uh, Baal and there was Asherah. There's these two. God says, I want you to take two bulls and I want you to go tear it down. Verse 26. And he says, and then I want you to build an altar to Yahweh your God on top of the stronghold here. Now, what is a stronghold? A str specifically, this was like a, a rock, maybe a high rock that was an easily defended area. It was, it was seen as a, a place of strength. And he says, so what I want you to do is I want you to tear down all of those boulders, use, use the ox to kind of pull all those, you know, pull down that old altar, then use the stones to build an altar to Yahweh. Okay. With the stones laid in due order, verse, uh, and then continuing, then take the second bull, which is the, the, the seven-year-old bull, and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So the Asherah was probably a, a tower made out of wood. Once you tear it down, then you can use that wood to burn. So it was... It's kind, of, it's kind of funny. Not only was it, hey, we're going to worship Yahweh, but we're also going to insult these other gods by tearing it down and burning it. Okay? And so it was, it was God's way of, of kind of asserting dominance. <laughs> Verse 27. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as Yahweh had told him. Good job, Gideon, right? But... Because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day... He did it at night. Now, I find it ironic because God has already proven to, to Gideon, I'm powerful. If I tell you that I can do something, you don't have to be afraid. But you know what? There's been a lot of people who are very critical of Gideon, and I'll get into this a little bit more. But remember, Gideon's essentially a new Christian, or, or a new believer, I should say. He's not Christian spectrum. But he was a new believer in Yahweh. He was... You know, and, and Yahweh was asking him to do some, some mighty things. So he does it at night. So he's hoping to get away with it, right? <laughs> Verse 28. But then the men of the town rose early in the morning. Behold, the altar of Baal was broken down and the Asherah beside it was cut down. And the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. Okay, they woke up the next day and they noticed something was different. Verse 29, and they said to one another, who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Now, how did they figure this out? Because he had 10 guys helping him, right? That's the problem. If you're going to do something, guys, you don't bring other people. What did they have to, how did they find out? They just went around and see, uh, saw which servants were still sleeping. Right? And they were exhausted from the night before. And then they questioned them and they found out who did this thing. Right? It was simple. So ironically, here is, here is uh, uh, Gideon. He's, he does it at night to try to get away with it, but he's not going to get away with it. Verse 30. Then the men of the town said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die. For he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. I, I just want you to think for a second about this. They wanted to kill him. Not get on to him. Not beat him up. They wanted to kill him for tearing down these altars. Think about this. Throughout the book of Judges, you know, uh, at least up until this point, they, they kind of knew that they shouldn't have been worshiping these other gods, right? And so, so Yahweh would come along and say, hey, you're not supposed to be worshiping these other gods. And he would save them. And they would go, you know what, Yahweh, you're right. We should be. They, they always knew that what they were doing was wrong. But now the culture has rotted so much that they're now willing to kill somebody for doing the right thing. They should have known. I mean, they don't even know the difference between right and wrong. They thought they were entitled to worship these other gods. And here's the guy that God is going... 
This is not even the enemy that, that he's supposed to fight against, right? He's supposed to fight against the Midianites and the Amalekites that are torturing the people. But he has to fight against his own people because the cultural rot has set in. What happens next is absolutely amazing. I want you to remember, Joash is his father. Joash is, is the one who owned the altars and who was leading the people to, to worship Baal. But watch what Yahweh does in the heart of Joash. Verse 31. But Joash said to all who stood against him, meaning stood against Gideon, Will you contend for Baal? Or will you save him? It, your Zeus-like God, who's supposed to be the most amazing God, you have to defend him? Right? Does he need you to save him? Is that how weak Baal is? Whoever contends for him, whoever comes after my son because of this, shall be put to death by morning. Woo! Look at Joash defending his son. But then he says something really theologically significant. He says, if he, if Baal is a god, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. Like if Baal is such a powerful god, let him handle it. So in verse 32... Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubbaal. That is to say, let Baal contend against him because he broke down his altar. Now, I want, you to, I want you to think about this for a second. His name was permanently changed from Gideon to Jerubbaal. Because he was saying, it, it says, let Baal contend with him. Let Baal do something to him. And so basically... Gideon became a living, breathing dare against Baal. Just see what you're going to do. And so as long as, so if anything would have ever happened to Gideon, they would have said, ah, well, that's what, that, that's what happens when you mess with Baal. But then if nothing ever happens bad to, to Gideon, everybody's like, hmm, I guess Baal is impotent. He's not powerful. He can't do anything. Interesting, right? And so all of a sudden, now he has become this representative of God, this, this witness of Yahweh and Yahweh's power over Baal. Interesting, right? But then just as this might have started to heat up, verse uh, 33, now all the Midianites and the Amalekites, these are the real enemies. These are the real brutal people that, that keep stealing their food and leaving them uh, to starve. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. So now they're coming back for, for their annual, hey, we're going to steal all your stuff and, and, and kill all your people. Verse 34, but the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. And he sounded the trumpet and the Abyssalites were called out to follow him. Now before we go on, he was clothed in the Spirit. Now, let me tell you something. Whenever you see in the Old Testament somebody's got the Spirit, it's about to get real, right? Because the Spirit gives them power and confidence. But what's interesting about this, the way that this is worded, is that he was clothed in the Spirit. Did you guys know that if you've said yes to Jesus Christ that you're not clothed in the Spirit, that the Spirit is inside of you? Uh, for, for Gideon, he had the spirit on the outside trying to work from the outside in. But the problem with being clothed in the spirit is you can take that cloth, off, that, that cloth off. But when you say yes to Jesus Christ as your Savior, that spirit is inside of you. It's a permanent. And you, you have the power of Gideon because the spirit is living inside of you. Okay? That's, that's something really important for you guys to know. In verse uh, 35, he says, He sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and, and they went up to meet him. But then, he kind of takes the spirit off for a minute, and he gets a little scared. 
Now, why is he scared? He's got all these people following him, ready to fight against the Amalekites and the, and the Midianites. Why is he so afraid? Well, what we're going to find out next week and then the week after is we're actually going to find the numbers, okay? Now, he got about 32,000 people to, to, to follow him. That's a lot of people. But the people they were fighting were 135,000. Over four times the amount of people that he got to follow him. So obviously, he was a little nervous. And again, here, here again, so many pastors uh, you know, have, have kind of called out Gideon for, for not having enough faith. But I don't know any of those pastors who have tried to lead uh, you know, a battle uh, against a superior fighting force by four, by four times. I mean, you know, give Gideon a little bit of credit. And he's also a new believer here. And so what does he do? Um, verse 36, And Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, which is kind of funny because if God has said it, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's going to happen, right? But he says, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, verse 37, Behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. I wonder if it's the same threshing floor that that he met the angel of the Lord at. You know, he goes back to that place because he feels like it's a holy place. And he says, If there's dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. So God, I, I need you to confirm for me. Verse 38, And, and it was so. And when he arose uh, early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. So he's like, wow, God really does. And then he probably started thinking to himself, yeah. You know, somebody could have come in the middle of the night with a bucket of water and just poured it on there, you know? So he feels bad about asking God for another thing. Verse uh, 39, then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on the ground let there be dew. Right? There's no way to fake that one. So in verse 40, and so God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. And he, here's, here's something, this is kind of a side note that I want to talk to the new believers about, Okay? I think oftentimes as new believers, sometimes we think to ourselves, we, we feel bad because we doubt God. But you know what? That's the process of you becoming, you know, of you starting to trust God, right? And it's okay if you go through that. And the reason why I know it's okay is because God provided for Gideon and God is going to provide for you too. But back to our original question. If everyone is doing what's right in their own eyes, will they mind if you do what's, what's right in God's eyes? Well, here's Gideon, who he went to go do what was right in God's eyes, and people hated him for it. They wanted to kill him. And it actually reminded me of something that Jesus said on the night before he was going to be crucified. And if you want to turn, uh, turn with me to... John chapter uh, 15, and I forgot to give you my speech. If we're going to have the, the scriptures up on the screen, but I always want you to follow along. Never trust the pastor. He could put whatever he wants up on the, on the screen. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 18. Jesus says to his disciples, he says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Like it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who follows Jesus Christ that the world doesn't like you. Why? Why would the world hate me if everyone's just doing what's right in their own eyes? Verse 19, he says, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. This whole, you do you, you be happy, and I'll be happy, and we'll all be happy, it's hogwash. Trust me, you start following the words of Jesus Christ, and people will hate you for it. And you know why? Because that whole you do you thing is a lie. At the end of the day, it's either 
the world who everyone does what's right in their own eyes, or the people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who are doing what's right in the eyes of God. That's, those are only two groups. And let me tell you something. The world gets really, really upset when one of its own becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But if they kept my word, they will keep also yours. In other words, there's going to be times where people who persecute you may end up becoming believers in Jesus Christ, right? Like, like that can happen too. In fact, in verse 23, it says, whoever hates me hates my father also. Did you know that if you start following the words of God and people start hating you, they don't really hate you? They hate God. I mean, I want you to think about it. Jesus came to a nation of Jews that, that believed in the Old Testament, that believed in Yahweh. He was the Son of God. They should have been happy to see Him. But they hated Him. Why? Jesus says because they really hate the Yahweh that they say that they, that they, they follow. Right? Verse 26, but here's, here's the key. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, the same Spirit that clothed uh, Gideon is going to live inside of you. Who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness to me. And here's what I'm going to tell you. If you, start, <laughs> if you start doing what's right in the eyes of God, the Spirit of God will begin to, to do work in people around you. Without you even trying. You know how, how the Holy Spirit starts His work? He starts by convicting them of their sin. That's why they hate us. Verse 27, And you also were bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And in the same way, this is the Jesus' promise, in the same way that Gideon became Jerubel, became a witness, became an example of the power of God, so will you be a witness and an example of the power of God in your life. It doesn't mean that it's easy. And so the question, back to our original question, if everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes, will they mind if you do what's right in God's eyes? Yes, they're going to mind. In fact, people will hate us for doing what's right in, the, uh, in God's eyes, but we become a witness for Him when we do. You know, as I was thinking about the cultural rot of this story of Gideon and and how they had totally lost uh, even, even the function, the, the, the idea of right and wrong, I started reflecting on my time on this earth. And I, I, I'm, I remember back in the 90s when we would have this uh, debate about abortion, because we're talking about abortion a lot right now, when we would have this debate about abortion, um, <clears throat> Back then, the people who were pro-abortion, they used to say, we want to make it safe, legal, and rare, right? Because there was this acknowledgement that it's not a good thing. Like, we, we don't like it, it's not a good thing, it's kind of icky, but, you know, there's these circumstances where we want to provide for women in an emergency situation so, so that, you know, if they have to, they can do this. That's what the whole rare part was. But have you seen right recently the vitriol that has been happening in our culture? I mean, they said, you know, some states are saying, listen, we, we don't want uh, abortions after 15 weeks. And people are losing their minds. Roe versus Wade, overturning it doesn't just, it doesn't get rid of abortions. It, it lets the states make up their own minds. And most states, I feel, are being very reasonable. Twelve 
to 15 weeks, that's after the first trimester. You, you've got all that time to figure it out. But people are having a fit. They've been, they've been, they burned down a pro-life center that, that, that fights for pro-life rights. And then here's the crazy thing. After, so, so you know, there's crazy people that do that kind of stuff. I, I watched this one thing where, where they were having, <clears throat> some people went outside of their church to pray, pray about this. And, and then there was this crazy lady that went with like all these babies. She's like, kill the babies. And she's like ripping them up. And you're like, what in the world is going on? Peep, there's the cultural rot has set in. After they burned down this uh, pro-abortion, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this pro-life uh, clinic, they left messages on their phone. I, I wanted to play one message for you. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, I'm calling because I read about the fire in your building, and I'm calling because I'm curious if it was arson or rather the good Lord showing you an example of hell and where you belong for being such a misogynistic bitch. Thanks for uh, basically going out there daily and making sure that women can't have control over their own bodies. And I'm so thankful that the good Lord finally took action on people like you. That was the most tame one. Let me tell you what being a witness looks like. There was a woman, uh, actually a young woman, uh, she was of Asian descent. Her name was Tu Tao. She became pregnant with her boyfriend. The boyfriend didn't want anything to have, have to do with her or her baby. So he said, just go get an abortion. Then she uh, went home to her dad. She said, Dad, I, I, I've got this problem. And her, her dad said, you can come and live in my house, but, um, but not with the baby. You need to go have an abortion. So Tutau ended up at a crisis pregnancy center, probably because she thought she could get an abortion there. And they come to find out crisis pregnancy centers don't do abortions. But they, they brought her in and they said, hey, listen, wh why don't we give you an ultrasound um, just to see if you even have a baby in there. And so, so not only did they find that she did have a baby in there, but she got to hear the heartbeat of the baby. And at that point, she's like, man, I, I can't do that. I can't do abortion. But she says, but what am I going to do? I have no place to live. And so that women's uh, uh, crisis pregnancy center called my parents. And they said, there's this girl who needs a place to live. Could she come? Could she come live with you? And so she did. So she, Tutau was basically like mine and Wesley's older sister for about nine months or probably a little over a year. She lived there. She had uh, Leah, her baby. And then soon after Leah was born, um, she realized, I, I, I can't take care of Leah. Like, I'm, I'm not ready for this. And so she went back to the women's pregnancy center, and they're like, no problem. We'll help you to find an adoptive family that will adopt your baby. And so here's a picture of Tutau. That's a picture of her. And you know, uh, this is a picture of her daughter, Leah, today. She's the one in the blue. And uh, Tutau, if you were to talk to her today, has actually met Leah and has a relationship with her. And she, she will tell you, I am so glad that I didn't have an abortion because Leah is a part of my life. Now... Um, Leah, I will tell you this, I disagree with her pretty much about just about everything, right? Even when it comes to abortion. In fact, it's, it shocks my conscience <laughs> to think that she was saved, you know, from abortion, but yet is an advocate for abortion. However, the children that you see in the picture with Leah are foster children. And her and her husband are huge foster parents, and then in the next picture, um, they're also, they also like to foster stray dogs, too. I wonder where she learned that from. Church, people will hate us for doing what's right in the eyes of God. But then we, begin, we become a witness. 
And you know, not only were my parents a witness to other people, but they were a witness to me and my brothers. Maybe there's a reason why I'm a pastor today. Because of the witness of my parents. You know, maybe you need to be a witness at work or home I know it's tough. Raul told a story. He worked at AT AT&T for years. He was a manager. And he told me about this this one guy who's this really gruff guy. And he found out that that Raul was a Christian. And he tortured Raul over that. I mean, every time he could make a joke, you know. And then Raul Raul would, you know, one of his team would mess up. and, And the guy would be like, in the middle of a meeting, Ha, Raul, where's your God now? You know, and and everybody would laugh at at Raul and this whole thing. Until that big gruff guy started having a problem in his family. One of his family members got really sick. And Raul said one day he, the guy passed by and there was this, this note that had been like folded like a thousand times. And he placed it on Raul's desk. And Raul opened the note. And it was from this guy. And he said, could you please pray for my family? Because Raul was a witness. And the man realized, I need the strength of his faith. Because here's the deal. People will hate us for doing what's right in God's eyes. But we become a witness for him. You know, people in our society today say, stop judging me. You're judging me. And and oftentimes we're not judging them. But you know what it is? It's because we're near people and we have the Spirit. The Spirit's convicting them. Yeah, I've been been accused of judging people that I'm like, do you think I think about you? Like, (laughs) Like, I don't sit around and think about you. But they think that I do because they feel convicted when I'm around them. And they say, stop judging you. Maybe that's why God called the book of Judges, Judges. Because he's calling you and me to lead people back into the worship of the Almighty God. Let's close uh, with this. uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. This is our memorization verse. This is one of the commands of Jesus. So uh, read this with me. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I stand before you today, Lord, and I want to say thank you for putting all the influences in my life, all these people who stood for you, Lord, even when it was hard to stand for you, Lord, they stood for you and they were a witness to me. Lord, you used those people in my life. Lord, I thank you for my amazing parents who are a great witness to me. Lord, I pray for those of us who are in this room, help us to be a great witness for others. Lord, help us to understand, Lord, that that when people hate us, Lord, they don't really hate us. They they hate you. And, and, And Lord... We are your opportunity to represent you. And and perhaps, Lord, perhaps people would come to a place in their life where they would say, I want to worship the God that Todd worships. I want to worship the God that David worships, that, that Lisa worships, that Roddy worships. And so, Lord, I I lift up this church family to you. Lord, help us to be an example for you. Help us to do what's right in the eyes of God and help us to not care what anybody else thinks because you're using us to change this society. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.